Well, we want to turn to some other, uh, well, regional and international geopolitical uh, ramifications of what we have going on. And we are very, very happy to be joined once again by Giorgio Cafaro, who's the CEO of Gulf State Analytics. Giorgio, thanks so much for being back with us. Thank you. Good to be with the two of you again. Well, really glad to have you with us again. And I, I, I hate to throw some sort of breaking news on you, but uh, maybe to bring it into a larger context, uh, about 20 minutes ago, it was reported by The Guardian that the Biden administration is privately expressing disappointment that, and I'm just reading from The Guardian, that Saudi Arabia, far from condemning the attacks by Hamas, is maintaining the violence would not have occurred if Palestinians had been granted an independent state. And, and I wanted to just start with that because I think it speaks to, you know, one of the elements of the conflict that we're really seeing, Giorgio, is is a very different set of narratives. Um, you know, the U.S. government, which, you know, rarely says much about the Palestinian issue, except here, there, uh, uh, you know, in little small pieces, is very, you know, aggressively taking the exact same line as the Israeli government. But we're seeing many regional governments and obviously people in the region and around the world um, take a, a very different view that I think they view as more balance. So, I mean, I just wonder what you think about the potential sort of ripple effects here of the position that the United States is taking, which seems so at odds with even, you know, many of their close allies. Yeah, I think in the region, we're going to see anti-Americanism rising in this upcoming period, especially with uh, the United States deploying an aircraft carrier right off the coast of Gaza. I know that um, in the Arabian Peninsula right now in the GCC countries and in Yemen, there is a lot of sympathy for the people in Gaza, and there is a lot of rage toward Israel and, by extension, the United States. And I think when we hear statements from government officials in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, it is reflective of where public opinion definitely is in these uh, countries. This is not to say that Hamas, as a political organization is loved by everyone in, in the region. There's certainly the history of tensions between Hamas and uh, different groups in the wider Arab uh, region. But right now, I mean, I think the anger is really directed very much on Israel right now. Um, the narrative in the West is that this uh, surprise attack into southern Israel on October 7th was unprovoked. Uh, that's what you hear a lot of people in Washington say, always using the word unprovoked. But I, I think um, in, in the Gulf and throughout the greater Middle East, obviously, you know, with the exception of Israel itself, that um, narrative about this being an unprovoked attack is, is rejected across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's been a few elements of this that have sort of like uh, had... I don't know, ricocheted into other parts of the world. One has been the issue of Russia. Um, the U.S. has, you know, Putin's been kind of making these statements to, to anger the U.S. I think there's also an element there that speaks to uh, the fact that the war in Ukraine has caused a, a rift between the Israelis and the Russians. Um, and on top of that, you know, I think Putin recently made some comment about that aircraft carrier being like, what is the U.S. doing? Uh, Russia was, you know, making sure to, to, to basically kind of blame the root of the problem on the U S in many ways. I'm sorry. So I guess, can you just like speak to the role of Russia here? Cause it's kind of been, you know, it hasn't been center stage, obviously. In fact, the war in Ukraine since it started, hasn't really been in the news as much. Um, but you do seem to have this rift between the pro Ukraine and then like the anti Russia, you know, side where you even have Zelensky attacking Putin, saying Putin's pro Hamas. Yeah, definitely complicated once we bring in sort of the Russia angle here. I think it's important to realize that Russia has been quite balanced toward the uh, conflicts between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, as I'm sure all your viewers are aware, Russia and Israel actually have a very deep relationship. And over the years, Netanyahu and Putin have a, a personal friendship, a personal relationship that has uh, become quite deep. It's a very strong relationship between the two leaders. And when it came, to, when it's when we've been looking at the situation in Syria, there's actually been a lot of coordination between uh, Russia and Israel, which has fueled quite a bit of tense, some degree of tension between Russia and Iran, actually. 
Um, but at the same time, Russia is against Israel's occupation of Palestinian land. Not only does Russia refuse to designate Hamas as a terrorist organization, but Hamas officials over the years have paid visits to Moscow. Uh, the Kremlin's view is that Hamas, whatever one may think of the organization, is a legitimate uh, is a group legitimately representing the people of Gaza, and that is certainly fueled some tension between Israeli and Russian officials with Israel being very angry at the Kremlin for uh, doing these things that sort of legitimize Hamas over the years. Now, when this current crisis erupted this month, I think it left Russia in sort of um, a weird position. On one hand, it has to be noted that Russia has gained from this in some sense. To be sure, international attention has shifted from Ukraine to the Middle East. That's something that Moscow is very pleased with. Uh, there's also good reason to consider that the U.S. will have to divert energy, um, you know, diplomatic energy, weapons, money, and other resources from Ukraine to Israel. For obvious reasons, that would be, you know, great news as far as the Russian government is concerned. At the same time, Russia does have some concerns about how this could play out throughout the wider region. As um, everyone knows, Lebanese Hezbollah has played an important role in sort of stabilizing the Syrian government next door. This is important to Russia's interests in the Middle East, seeing to it that Bashar al-Assad's government maintains the control that it does have inside Syria. So in the event that the tensions between Hezbollah and Israel would escalate, potentially spiral out of control and turn into an all-out conflict, that would probably result in Hezbollah fighters leaving Syria to come back to Lebanon, and the Russians don't want to see that happen, uh, given the existing volatility in Syria. So it's not so clear whether the situation in Gaza and Israel is on balance positive or negative from the Russian government's perspective. I would say it's pretty, pretty mixed. But nonetheless, um, it is giving Putin an opportunity to really make the case that U.S. leadership and U.S. diplomacy in the Middle East has been a failure. Um, the Russian line is that what is going on with the, the Palestinians and Israelis killing each other these past few days is the U.S.'s fault. That's a message that resonates very well with Arab audiences, and I think that the Kremlin is going to continue um, putting out these messages when addressing this crisis. You know, one issue that I think a lot of people are wondering about that I'm curious your thoughts on is, is how this will affect the possibility of uh, Saudi-Israeli normalization, which, of course, the U.S. was working very hard uh, to, you know, to achieve. And I think maybe relatedly, you know, what sort of pressures does this put on different Arab countries that have already uh, normalized with Israel? It's a great question. You know, I think I was sort of in the minority on this, but even before the Hamas surprise attack against southern Israel, I did not think the chances were good Saudi Arabia would join the Abraham Accords. And, and I know that many people disagreed with that assessment and they were expecting Saudi Arabia to normalize. But right now, amid this current crisis, there are Pretty much, I think all ex experts agree that Saudi Arabia is not going to be on the verge of normalizing diplomatic relations with Israel. I think the Saudis are trying to sort of uh, take somewhat of a, um, you know, uh, sort of sit back uh, and sort of watch how things pan out approach. There are so many unknown variables in the equation we don't know if slash when Iran will be playing a more direct role in this crisis. Same can be said about the U.S. and a potential direct role played by the United States. We don't know the ways in which this conflict could spill into other countries such as Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen. We, we just simply don't know how this is going to play out. Um, if the Israelis are going to do an on-the-ground uh, invasion of Gaza and try to occupy this coastal enclave where 2.3 million people live, we, if that were to happen, it's unclear sort of how 
much mayhem would result and what the consequences of that would be. And also, we don't know how people throughout the wider Islamic world would respond to that. The bottom line is Saudi Arabia normalizing with Israel right now would just be way too risky. The Saudis have a leadership role in the Islamic world. The king of Saudi Arabia is the custodian of the two holy mosques. And if there's a situation where there is so much widespread um, anger and rage throughout Arab countries and Muslim majority countries, it would be very damaging to Saudi Arabia's religious legitimacy to normalize with Israel right now. When it comes to the Arab states, though, that have joined the Abraham Accords, such as the UAE, well, it puts them in a tough place right now. They, they want to benefit from a normalized relationship with Israel. Um, there's many ways, uh, whether we're talking about investment, trade, intelligence sharing, defense relations, tourism, and all these obvious ways UAE and others can benefit from normalized relations with Israel. But given you know public opinion in the region, uh, there are certainly some serious political risks for any Arab leader that is, or any Arab government that is seen as allying with Israel. Interestingly, though, we should point out that the UAE um, responded to the Hamas incursion into southern Israel by very, very strongly condemning Hamas. And um, that, I think, sent a, a strong message about the UAE's commitments to its uh, newly normalized relationship with Tel Aviv. But again, I think the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, and the Moroccans are going to try to be careful in sort of striking a balance. But, you know, if this violence exacerbates or if this spreads into more of a regional, uh, region-wide conflict, striking that balancing act will be increasingly difficult. And, you know, Giorgio, just one last thing here, and that is the Yemen factor. I mean, you have the Houthis uh, threatening to essentially join Hamas in an attack on Israel if the U.S. intervenes in the conflict, um, saying that they'd be, they'd be ready to participate with missile and, you know, drone strikes and other military options. Uh, and so, you know, what is that? You know, do you think that's actually like something that, that would poss be possible? I mean, I'm not sure. You know, when a lot of these groups say U.S. intervention, I'm not sure entirely what they mean because this couldn't happen without the intervention of the U.S. on so many levels. But obviously they're speaking to something there. It's not necessarily an empty threat. And then also, like, if that were to take place, like, what might that mean for the Gulf states that have up until now managed to have this kind of, like, peace taking place uh uh, and, and at least like a de-escalation of the war with the Houthis. Yeah, well, you know, uh, just last month, there was some real diplomatic progress uh, in relation to the Yemen conflict. The highest level Houthi delegation to ever visit Saudi Arabia went there in the middle of last month. And there were talks in Riyadh that the Saudi leadership said were very productive that Saudi, excuse me, that Houthi delegation went with an Omani delegation, and that raised some optimism about the Saudis and the Houthis coming closer to some sort of a, a pact, is kind of some truce. But the tragedy is in the Middle East, in the Middle East, is that often progress that diplomats achieve at the table can get reversed by violence on the ground, even in another part of the Middle East. And I think we're worried right now that that's what's going on. Um, as, as you pointed out, the Houthis recently explained that if the U.S. would get directly involved in this crisis in Gaza, and obviously given the U.S. relationship with Israel, U.S. vetoing, U.N. Security Council resolutions, U.S. arming Israel, everyone knows the U.S. is involved already and has been for decades, but the red line would be a direct U.S. military intervention in Gaza. The Houthi leadership said that if that happened, all U.S. targets in the Middle East are fair game for the Houthis. Now, if you're in Yemen and you're talking about U.S. targets, you're, you're talking about um, targets in the UAE, other GCC states, and this is to say that if the U.S. takes an action that the Houthis see as crossing their red line, and if they make good on their threat, then that would really damage the peace process between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. And um, that 
is obviously something very troubling to all the diplomats from different countries and UN officials who have been working so hard to try to wind down the Yemen conflict. Giorgio Cafaro, CEO of Gulf State Analytics, as always, really appreciate you joining us and all your analysis here on the Freedom Side. Thank you.